You're listening to the Nourish Child Podcast, episode number 88. Hit it. Welcome to the Nourish Child Podcast, a show about childhood nutrition, feeding kids, and dealing with the ups and downs of growing a healthy child. Here's your host, registered dietitian and childhood nutrition expert, Jill Castle. Kids can be funny about food. They may refuse certain textures like slippery, wet, or dry foods. They may look at a new food and reject it outright. They may be highly offended by the smell of foods like eggs or broccoli. It can be so baffling as a parent to understand why your child is reacting in such a way to food and then to know what exactly to do about it. Well, today on the show, I have Alicia Grogan from the website Your Kids Table. She's an occupational therapist specializing in feeding and sensory issues. So today we'll be chatting about sensory processing and how it relates to eating. We will cover the signs you should be aware of, where to find help, and some strategies you can use at home. You'll find today's show notes over at jillcastle.com forward slash 088. That's 088 for episode number 88. So how's everybody doing? I'm in the middle of summer as I record this summer of 2019. Just actually finished up 4th of July weekend. And um, it's always a big one for our family because it's my husband's birthday. So it's always a fun time. And actually, this summer, it was the first time I was able to have all four of my kids home this summer at the same time. So it was a lot of fun. One of the things that came up this week, actually, before our festivities started was I read something about, well, I actually, I was interviewed by Healthline for an article about childhood obesity and where we are today and how we have improved and how we haven't improved. And I was prepping for the interview and I read something by a medical healthcare professional who was quoted as saying that education doesn't change behavior. And so if you're on my Facebook page, you know I went off on a little bit of a rant about that, and I thought I would share that here because I feel like that is an excuse that is oftentimes given for why we aren't improving the health of our children, that we need to change our environment, we need to change the food, we need to do this, we need to do that. And yes, we probably need to do all of those things. But to say that education, awareness, empowering parents with education does not change behaviors, I'm calling BS on that because I just don't believe that that's true. And in fact, I know that we have research that tells us, we have research on anticipatory guidance. And what anticipatory guidance is, is basically giving parents a head up or giving you a heads up about what's happening or why something is happening. And that heads up or that anticipatory guidance that's given ahead of time, particularly we know from research when it relates to feeding children, absolutely has a positive impact. We can see this in studies on baby led weaning and other studies on responsive feeding. For example, in these studies, they show that when parents get information up front, they make fewer mistakes and they actually do a better job at feeding their children. You know, in my TEDx talk, which I'll include the link in the show notes, I talked a lot about what happens when parents don't get educated early on. And I think, unfortunately, that's a pretty common thing. We we don't have high school home economics. We don't have parenting classes for parents. We do a really good job of preparing parents for birthing a baby, but we don't do a good job of preparing them and educating them in the area of feeding their children, in the area of nutrition and food choices, in the area of just parenting around food. So a lot of that is what I have on my blog and on this podcast. But personally, I feel like it's a national travesty that we don't help parents 
upfront with nutrition education, with that anticipatory guidance that goes around nutrition and feeding. And I think it's a disgrace that parents have to figure all of this out by themselves and for some of them have to pay a lot of money to correct the mistakes or to support their child to reverse some of the things that have, you know, played out over time related to food and nutrition. So ultimately, our children end up paying the price for parents who don't get that support and guidance and education up front. So my personal stance and my personal belief is that if we want to see healthier outcomes in our children, including lowered rates of obesity, we need to impact parents with knowledge early and often. We need to educate them, tell them what to expect, show them how to navigate nutrition, show them, teach them how to feed their child. And I know this isn't the only answer, but I absolutely believe it has to be part of the solution. And I believe we continue to spin our wheels because we have not addressed that issue. Okay, so my rant is over. I invite you to sound off if you have any additional rants or perspectives or comments about that. Go over to my Facebook page, The Nourished Child, and you can sound off there and let us know what you think about the fact that education does not change behavior. Okay, on with the show. Alicia Grogan is a mom and pediatric occupational therapist who specializes in sensory processing. Much of her experience has been working with families in their homes, which has given her the tools and insights to help them learn and use sensory in their everyday life. But she's also lived this journey herself, as one of her own children has sensory needs. She gets the overwhelm and the power behind sensory because it not only helped her child reach his full potential, it's also given them a stronger bond than she could ever have imagined. Her program, Sensory Solutions, is a good place to begin if you want to get a handle on sensory issues and help your child. I'm including the link to purchase the program in the show notes over at jillcastle.com forward slash 088. I need to disclose to you, however, that I am an affiliate of this program, which basically means if you purchase using the link I have in my show notes, I will receive a small commission, which I'll use to help run this podcast. As you know, an editor to make this show a quality listen for you. And unfortunately, well, fortunately for him, but unfortunately for me, he's not free. So any sort of income I generate on behalf of the podcast, I put right back into it. So anyways, let's rock and roll. Here's my interview with Alicia about sensory challenges in kids. Hi, Alicia. Welcome to the Nurse Child Podcast. Hi, Jill. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to have you on here today. You're an occupational therapist and the owner of Your Kids Table, and I'm really excited to dig into sensory processing challenges in children and really start to tie it into how and what they do at the table in terms of, of eating. But before we dig into this, why don't you tell my audience about yourself, the work you do, how you came to do your work, you know, in your own words. Tell us about you. Absolutely. So I am an occupational therapist and my two passions and what I ended up specializing in as an occupational therapist happen to be feeding challenges and sensory processing. I was really fortunate to be in a strong graduate program as an occupational therapist that just had a strong focus on sensory. And then my first job right out of school was working for a private practice for a woman that was just an absolute sensory processing guru and had studied under Jean Ayers, who is like the godmother of sensory processing. So I was heavily influenced and had great foundation early in my career in sensory processing. But I ended up moving states and finding myself in an early intervention position a few years later. And so I was working with children that were zero to three years old. 
And as an occupational therapist, I expected that my caseload would heavily be sensory and a lot of fine motor, which is what OTs tend to work on with children. And I was very surprised to find that more than half of my caseload was kids with feeding difficulties. So I had to learn fast. <laughs> and I tried, I tried pretty much every method out there for picky eating and for feeding challenges. And I became incredibly passionate about it because I could see the dramatic impact that it was having in their life. It wasn't long before I realized with my sensory background that there is a ton of overlap for a lot of kids with sensory and picky eating. And not to mention, I have three boys of my own, and they have given me my fair share of personal practice <laughs> as well. <laughs> Yes, it's funny how, you know, your own children sort of make the whole practice area for me, pediatric nutrition, for you, occupational therapy and and uh, feeding problems. It just really brings your clinical knowledge to life in a very unique way. Absolutely. I remember when my second son was born and I had everything go right with my with my oldest son and I was shocked at the stress that I felt as a parent and I knew what to do. So it really gave me an entirely fresh perspective when I thought I was already really empathetic with the parents that I worked with. I certainly had a much deeper sense of what they were going through at that point when my own child was not eating across the table from me, meal mm -hmm. after meal. I think it's one of the great stressors on parents when, you know, they're faced with a child who, you know, for whatever reason, whether it's sort of a, your garden variety, picky eating, just the developmental phase that a child goes through to sensory based picky eating. It's very, it's very hard as a parent when you know the one thing that you can do is provide food and meals for your child. And that's not something that's working very well between the two of you. It's, it's very difficult. That's, that's exactly it. That's exactly it's, it's We feel that it's our primary role. And when we're, you know, it's, it's at the top of the list of what we need to do for our, our child. And when it's not going well, it does. It gets extremely stressful. So tell us about your kid's table so people know, you know, where they can find you. I usually do that at the end, but I feel like it relates so much to what we're going to be talking about. But you have a website called Your Kid's Table. You know, tell me what people can expect when they go there. Absolutely. So what your kids table is all about is providing parents with tools that I use. So my strategies, my tactics, my perspective on sensory development, sensory challenges, and anything related to kids eating. I and mean, there's certainly a particular emphasis on kids that are struggling with picky eating, kids that are struggling to get onto table foods, as well as all of the basic kind of milestone stuff. The reason that I started Your Kids Table was because my friends and former clients were constantly calling me or texting me a question that was not something I could answer very easily. I'm sure you can relate to this, Joe. You're standing at a party and somebody says, what can I do? My son is only eating four foods. Well, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a little yeah. bit more of a, a conversation we probably need to have over a cup of coffee, probably a few conversations. And I felt really called to provide detailed information that parents could just easily access and follow so that they could start putting some of these strategies in their own home and begin to decrease that stress. Yeah, yeah. I had the same kind of conversations. It's almost like pull the lid off the can of worms. <laughs> it's yes, like that's a that's big conversation. I find that, you know, in my own practice, I'm often, you know, saying things like you can't make a kid eat or, you know, it's not just about food. There's like all this other stuff going on. You know, just because you get broccoli on the table doesn't mean you're going to have success. There's just so much more involved. And so when we're talking about sensory processing, what are we really, for, for listeners out there who may not have ever heard of sensory processing, can you break that term down for us in a basic way so that everybody has a grasp of, of what we're going to dig into here? I can. 
And it's one of my favorite things to talk about. And I want to say to your listeners, if you have never heard of sensory processing, you are not alone. Most parents are never taught what sensory processing is. So what we're really talking about is how our brain interprets all the different senses in our environment at any given time. And it's a little bit more complex than just the five senses you learned about in kindergarten. It also involves our sense of movement, our sense of body awareness, kind of knowing where we are in space to be able to get up and walk across the room. Our brain is constantly taking in different sensations sorting through them and deciding which ones we need to pay attention to, which ones we need to ignore. And sometimes that process that's happening in the brain is just not running very smoothly. And that's when we start to see different kinds of sensory challenges pop up. And they can be related to everything from eating to getting dressed to even being able to play well with peers. Mm. So it's a brain-based processing disturbance? Yeah, it's or I would say maybe variance is a word that I would I would probably mm-hmm. use because sensory processing is truly unique. We do see common tendencies. For instance, most of us do not like the sound of nails down a chalkboard, but we probably could pull a room of 50 people and find a handful of people that that actually doesn't bother. They're not annoyed or set on edge by that noise. We could probably pull in that same room of people or children for that matter and find some some children that love to wear tight, snug, compression gear type clothes and others that really want loose, baggy types of clothes on and then still another percentage of people that just don't even care. So... All of those types of things is just kind of a variance in the way that we're all taking in that input and how our brain is processing it. It does become a disturbance or a difference is a word that I use a lot when it starts to interfere with a child or an adult for that matter, when it interferes with their ability to function in daily life. So what might that look like? Yeah, so... You know, in terms of eating, that's one of the most common areas that we see is that if a child is not processing sensory input well while they're eating, that could look like something that tastes extremely strong to them that doesn't to most people. So they may be particularly sensitive to sweet, sour, savory, salty flavors or spicy flavors, or At the other end of the spectrum, they can also almost seem to not taste anything. And in the same way, they might not feel where the food is in their mouth very well. That sounds like a really strange thing to think about, but it's our sense of touch. And if it's not very refined, kids can actually lose track of where food is in their mouth, for instance, or the feeling of it in their mouth is so uncomfortable. I'm sure we can all relate to a food that we just do not care for the texture of. It makes us feel really uncomfortable. It's displeasurable. Some kids have so many textures that are making them feel that way. And that's why they're trying to control (laughs) what foods are coming in. And they want to only trust some of those foods. But we do see it in lots of other areas, you know, as well. A child who is not processing sensory information well is also maybe distracted or can almost seem like they are zoned out at the same time. Like we, again, opposite ends of the spectrum, if their brain is kind of over-processing information or under-processing information, and sometimes the information just isn't getting registered at all. So when our kids aren't processing that information well, their brain is trying to constantly. And when their brain is focusing on that, their brain is not able to focus on communication or playing with their peers or learning or, you know, again, eating or even being able to fall asleep at night. Wow. So, so it's very, it sounds like very subtle things that can really have an impact on their functionability in the world. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. And it's very easy to miss. And often over the years talking to parents, one of the telltale signs that I know something sensory is going on 
is when they start the sentence with my my son or my daughter does this really weird thing and fill in the blank because it's it might seem something sh- like something strange like they may like to curl up in a ball behind a couch because they're they're looking for more sensory input they're looking for more sensations or they're in a bathroom at a public restroom and their child has a total meltdown because the hand dryer goes off. I mean, a lot of children don't like that, but when we see our child melt to the ground and scream at the top of their lungs, it's very easy to think, are they having a meltdown because they're tired or they're hungry, where there could be some sensation linked to that behavior. So you really do have to kind of take a step back and look at the bigger picture of what's going on and look for patterns for when your child is having a difficult time, whether that means they're melting down, tantruming, participating in dangerous behavior, or being overly sensitive. Mm -hmm. And when you think about sort of the warning signs a parent might see around eating, what would you say, you know, some of those top warning signs would be that might indicate sensory processing challenges? For me, that is when a child gags, as soon as they touch or taste something. And and oftentimes, even if they see something, because just the look of it is them imagining what it's going to taste or feel like. And so they immediately have a gag response. And this is different. We definitely see some children with feeding difficulties gag once food is in their mouth. So they might, in that case, have a difficult time chewing or managing the food in some way. But when it's sensory, it's instantaneous. Because as soon as they get that feedback, that sensation, they gag right away. And another one also is when a child is extremely sensitive to even touching different textures. So you'll usually see this show up in different areas of their life. They don't want to finger paint put the glue away. They don't care about the sandbox. They don't want to walk across the yard in their bare feet. All of those are signs that their touch system, their tactile system is very sensitive. And if it's sensitive with their hands and on other areas of their body, chances are it's also with their food if they're a picky eater. You know, it makes me think about Well, I imagine some of the listeners out there are thinking, you know, is there something I should have done when my child was a baby to prevent some of this sensory stuff? What would you say to that question? Oh, my gosh. I would first say it is so easy to miss the the signs. And for some kids, they don't develop these sensory differences or challenges until later in life. Although it's more common that they are present at an earlier age, it's extremely difficult when you're uneducated about sensory to know what to look for or to see that as a clue that something else is going on. It can be very helpful if these signs are caught to begin addressing it at an early age. But again, Some kids, once they enter that kind of typical picky eating phase, they can start to develop a sensitivity over time from lack of exposure to different foods, in which case that stuff that you could have done as a baby would not have helped prevent where your child is at a later time. You know, I remember when my when my children were babies, I played a lot of kissy face. I don't know. Why? I mean, I think I know why. <laughs> well, I, I love to kiss them and cuddle and smush them, their cheeks and stuff. But I also remember, you know, my early days as a clinical dietitian being on the feeding team at Mass General. And one of the things that always would come up was, you know, just making sure that you were touching a young child's mouth and that you were really always sort of doing things to desensitize the oral area. Is that something that you know, you buy into as well? Or is that current thinking? I mean, this was a long time ago, Alicia, like more than 20 years ago. (laughs) So, Um, Oh my gosh, absolutely it is. And I am a big fan of starting toothbrushing early and just getting something in there. You know, even if you're using a massager or a pinky finger to help them get into their mouth. And, you know, it's interesting because 
Uh, when I work with my students that have children that are having a difficult time transitioning to table foods, one of the very first questions that they get asked in class is, did your child chew on teething toys? And so mm-hmm. many of the children have not, and they are having mm-hmm. a hard time learning how to eat because the whole oral cavity is so sensitive. They haven't had the practice chewing that they need. So I absolutely agree with the more that you can expose them to touch around the mouth with teethers, with your fingers and your, you know, like you said, the kisses and the squeezes, all of that is so good for them. And in a similar way, exposing them to different textures and play in general at an early age is just excellent for their development in so many ways, even beyond feeding. So I guess my next question or my my next observation, and I see this in my own practice, is this desire, particularly with feeding, to keep babies really clean. And mm-hmm. I suspect mm-hmm. that the wiping of the mouth is probably, you know, good for sensory, but the you know, the the dirty baby with the food all over the face and the fingers and the, you know, puree up the elbows, that that's like non-existent anymore. I don't see very many families allowing their children to get that messy. What would you have to say about the value in getting messy with eating? Oh my gosh, Jill, I'm going to try not to pull out my soapbox right now because you just hit a hot <laughs> button issue for me. <laughs> I uh, Yes, babies need to get messy eating. You're right. It's something that has sort of changed. It's something that I write about a lot on uh, your kid's table. <laughs> and years ago, uh, you know, on Pinterest, I had one of my posts go viral. And it was so interesting to see all of the comments with people that were really angry at me that I had suggested to let their, their babies get messy. Because I get it, it's it's hard to kind of deal with the mess. But I think if we change our mindset, and realize that our children are really learning and improving that sensory processing. So we talked a little earlier about how the brain is taking in all of that information, all from their senses, and they're processing it. Well, if there's not a lot of input, a lot of sensations, there's not a lot of practice that the brain is getting. And those moments when a baby has the mashed potatoes up to their elbows are so important. And I think that there are ways as parents that we can just help ourselves get more comfortable by stripping them down to their diaper, putting the the tablecloth underneath for easy cleanup. It's the payoff is so worth it in the long run because your child has so many benefits that I do think just absolutely set the stage for a, a more well-rounded eater throughout their life, really. Mm-hmm. I agree. I, I'm a fan of it. I advocate that for my clients as well. And there's just so much. I mean, if you think about it, and I know you might want to expand on this a little bit, but there's so many senses, right? And food offers like the taste, the touch, the smell, the vision, the appearance, you know, that kids can really learn and gain so much from just that experience of food. I think it's my, maybe one of the elements in a young child's life that can really capitalize on all five of the senses. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Because eating is a complete sensory experience. And there's just no way to get around helping children play with and explore their foods. And and I would even go as far to say that when you're working with a young child, uh, so if you have a child that's even two or three years old at your table, and this is something that you haven't done, to be honest with you, even older, it's so helpful to allow them that freedom to explore their foods without worrying about table manners. That's usually one of the concerns that I hear from parents that even for babies, they're worried that they're teaching them future bad habits. But truly, you're giving them a much bigger gift. And there are ways to kind of keep parameters around how to uh, you're able to have that free play and really explore the food. And some kids, I find even older kids that never went through that stage, still really need it. And once somebody gives them the okay to do it, 
it's an awesome thing to watch them really progress because they're they're getting the sensory processing development that they really need. I love networking. I'm part of a podcast network called Parents on Demand, or the Pod Network. We are a network of fun and educational podcasts perfect for your family. You can explore the shows in the network by going to parentsondemand.com and searching specific categories. Parents on Demand also has a download for a free network app on iOS and Android, so you can listen to your favorite shows or find new podcasts. Subscribe through iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music, iHeartRadio, or another provider. Every month, I will feature a podcast that I think will be helpful or of interest to you. Here's this month's podcast feature. Are you a new, expectant, or aspiring mom? The Pure Nurture Podcast is for moms just like you looking for information and inspiration to create a healthy new life for yourself and your growing baby. I'm Christy Rodriguez, and I'm the host of the Pure Nurture Podcast. On the show, I share interviews with experts, educators, and moms who focus on a natural, holistic, mind-body approach to pregnancy, birth, and postpartum health. Join us today at purenurture.com forward slash podcast. Let's shift sort of gears a little bit and talk about picky eating and how sensory processing and picky eating somehow play a role with each other. Yeah. You know, eating is a sensory experience. So when a child, as you said, as soon as a child comes to the table or is hopefully helping to prepare the food and they're seeing the foods come out, they're already starting with sensory processing their brain is taking in that visual input and trying to make sense out of it. They're making a guess as to what it's going to feel like and what it might taste like. They're looking at it and already having some sensory processing. And that continues as they smell the food, as they touch the food. We're looking at the texture, the taste of the food. All of those aspects are being processed in the brain. So again, when we think about sensory processing challenges, if a child's sensory processing tends to sort of over-process the sensory input, their brain is going to be telling them that is too strong of a taste or too strong of a texture because the way their brain is processing the input. And this is where a lot of parents, I think, get a little bit frustrated because it doesn't make sense because their experience is so different. You know, as a mom or a dad, you look at the chicken nugget and you pick up the chicken nugget and you take a bite out of it and you think, there's nothing wrong with this chicken nugget. It, it doesn't have a strong flavor. It doesn't have a strong texture. But a child, you know, again, person to person, we're all processing sensory input differently. And when we know these kids have more sensory challenges, we know that they are processing that information very differently than most people. And what they're experiencing is very real to them because it's what their brain is telling them, that it's too big of a taste, too strong of a smell, to the point that it makes them even gag and in some cases even throw up. Yeah. So do all children who are picky have sensory challenges? I do not believe so. There are so many different layers to picky eating and so many different root causes, uh, you know, I would say. And there is obviously the typical picky eating phase that many children go through. That is a typical part of development for a lot of kids. And sensory is often not a component for them. You know, they may be making some selections because they prefer a certain taste or texture for sure, but there isn't a significant difference where the experience is really painful or so displeasurable to them that they're gagging. Again, some kids have difficulty just chewing and managing the food, and sensory isn't a component at all. I would say Mm -hmm. that in my personal experience, I do see that the majority of kids have at least some sensory component going on with their eating, Mm -hmm. probably more than half in my personal experience. Do you feel like 
there are more and more kids who are having sensory challenges? It does seem to be that way. It does. And, you know, I think that there are a lot of different theories as to why that is. And I think some of it is our change in culture. As you said, one example, just babies not getting as messy. And I think Mm -hmm. our kids aren't playing outside and active and exploring and there's more screen time. That's a big generalization. But overall, that's the trend that we see happening. And it certainly seems like that could be a component of it because we know that when kids are busy playing and exploring their environments, that it is helping to develop their sensory processing. I often wonder about just early nutrition and brain development and whether, you know, certain process of developing the brain and that rapid growth in the first couple of years of life has anything to do with it as well. Because I also feel like I'm seeing more. We'd see kids with sensory, but we weren't seeing as many now that I do. And and I guess what goes hand in hand with that is that I'm seeing a lot of older picky eaters, which, you know, 20 years ago, that it was all toddlers. And now, you know, we're seeing kids that are you know, school age. Yeah. Teenagers or, you know, the eight, nine, 10 year olds who are now having a negative social mm-hmm. impact because of it. Why does it seem like there are more kids with sensory challenges? Right. And, you know, I think, you know, one of the other theories are environmental issues. The sensory system is one of the last things to develop in utero. So Mm -hmm. we also know that children that are sometimes even born just a few weeks early often might have some more sensory differences than their peers that were born at full term. And certainly when we have a premature baby, we certainly expect to see more sensory issues. So that's certainly part of it. I think that there are probably a lot of contributing factors. If there's a parent out there that has a child who has sensory challenges, what should that parent be thinking about in terms of getting help for her child or his child? Yeah, that's a great question. So The thing is, is that a lot of kids, because we all have a sensory system and we're all processing that information, first of all, every child, every person has sensory preferences. So we all have sensations that we like. We all have ones that we even seek out. You know, some of us love to have a big, heavy blanket on us when we go to sleep or are very calmed and relaxed by a massage. That's sensory input. I had one of those last week. Yeah, and right. And how (laughs) did it relax and calm you and ground you? Yes, it sure did. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) And so I think that that's a really great place to start is to start realizing that your kid may not have a severe issue because there's some sensory processing challenges going on. A lot of kids need a little bit more help with sensory just in terms of understanding it and knowing how to help address their needs in more appropriate ways. Because what we start to see is even when there's just a little bit of sensory differences going on, if it's starting to affect their life in any way, that's going to have a ripple effect usually across the family. So knowing how to better address those needs, for instance, a child that really seeks a lot of movement may participate in really dangerous activities like climbing the dresser and standing on the top Mm -hmm. of it or, you know, doing dangerous things. But when we can learn how to help them better and redirect them to better activities that help them get their needs met, but are safe, that's a great first step. So I do teach a online class for sensory processing to help parents understand what it is and identifying their needs. And it's a great Mm -hmm. class if you're unsure and wanting to explore more and help support your child. If you know that your child has sensory needs and you've already identified these different areas throughout their life, it's always a great idea to get an evaluation by an occupational therapist that specializes in sensory processing. And you do want to make sure that you're looking for that specialization. Not all occupational therapists have advanced training in in sensory. 
but the evaluation will give you a lot of helpful feedback on what your next steps should be. Will you share that link to your online program? Because I, I would like to share that in the show notes so that people can check that out if they if they'd yes, like to. Yes, absolutely. And uh, I would right. also love to share with your audience too. Uh, we do have a a free one hour workshop where we kind of just walk through what the beginning steps of helping manage sensory processing are. So that's totally free and a good way to learn what our system is and to even take the four steps that we teach and to start applying them to your life. So I'll share that as well. Okay, that'd be great. And in terms of your system, is this something that you've developed over time or is it a combination of different approaches out there or how did you how'd you come to develop that? Yeah, so it's based on the work of Jean Ayers, uh, who I said earlier was sort of the, the mother of sensory processing, sensory integration. And she's done a lot of research on sensory processing and its effect on children. So that is what my experience and my, my knowledge is based in. But to take her, to take her work and make it doable for a lot of families. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I worked with a behavior expert and together we created this four-step process that parents could easily repeat. So when they, to start identifying, is that a sensory behavior that my child is having? And if it is, how do I help them? So we developed this system after working with hundreds of families online so that it was really repeatable and doable, no matter what types of sensory challenges a child was facing. And it's so nice that it's online because people can access it when they need it and when they can, right? Because we're talking parents here and parents have very busy schedules. They're not necessarily able to attend, you know, live classes or live sessions. It can be a real barrier for them. So it's nice to hear that it's an online option for them. When we talk about sensory and particularly feeding problems, what other resources are out there for parents that you know of? Well, sensory, well, yourkidstable.com. Is a great yes. <laughs> we, oh my goodness, the amount of articles that I have on there. You know, that's a really good question. I would have to say that there are not a lot of resources that combine both approaches. But my my favorite formal course, which is geared towards other professionals, and I know you have lots of professionals listening in too, although parents can take it as well, is called the SOS Approach to Feeding. And they really, it's the work of uh, Dr. Kay Toomey, and she's just amazing. Uh, she works out of Colorado and has just been training people all over the world. I, I took her course but she really does put an emphasis on looking at a child's sensory needs if they are there and connecting that to their feeding problems and working through it together. So SOS approach is a great one to, to look at as well. What are some of the, and I don't want you to, you know, give all your stuff away, but you know, for those parents that are out there that are listening, you know, are there some easy tips or strategies a parent could use to help their child better experience the sensory aspects of food and eating? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to give you one of my favorite tips, and I do think that it's one of the most powerful, using sensory bins or messy play bins with your child on a regular basis. You know, for years in my career, I recommended this. It's kind of a standard OT kind of thing to do is we basically have a large box or bin and we fill it with dry rice or dry beans or shaving cream or finger paint, basically any kind of texture you could think of. And we get kids playing in it because of the the sensory processing that happens as a result. It's excellent for helping improve sensory processing of different textures. So even though it's not related to eating, it's helping the brain process different touch sensations in a much better way. For years, I would recommend this to parents as just a supplement that they could be doing to therapy, to just regularly, you know, when they could play in sensory bins. I was working with one family and the mom was a teacher and she was a special ed teacher 
and knew a lot about sensory already, never had realized the connection between eating and sensory. So when I made the suggestion to do the sensory bins, she took it really seriously. And she started playing in sensory bins with her son. Now, he was only about a year and a half years old, was having major feeding difficulties. And I will say that there were a lot of layers to his feeding issues. It wasn't just sensory. And we had spent months at this point working through a lot of them. And we started really concentrating on the sensory bins. She did them every day. And I immediately, I was starting to come back to sessions. And it was extremely unusual because I was seeing these pretty significant jumps in progress. I mean, just I would come back the next week and there would be five to 10 new foods he was eating in a week's time. And it took me a couple of weeks to realize that the, the, the big difference that had happened was the regularity in which she was providing him play and sensory bins and that she was rotating different bins, which we had talked about. So, you know, seven days a week, he was spending 20 minutes playing in a different texture. And we saw uh, over the next couple of months, just that growth continue. Now, again, we were using lots of other strategies as well. But I do strongly believe that the work that he was doing in those sensory bins helped improve his sensory processing so much that it allowed all of the other strategies that we were using to really take hold much quicker than we normally see it. After that time, which was this was several years ago now, I've used that process over and over again with other kids and have just seen the same success. So I know uh, it's an extra activity, but one of the things I love about it is it's not something you have to do at mealtime. It doesn't have to be stressful. It doesn't have to involve pressure. And if your kid is really sensitive, which a lot of our picky eaters are, to getting their hands in a different texture, just start slow and you just never want to force them. Everything with sensory, it's important to remember to never force a child to participate. Yeah, it's so interesting to think that like play with your hands could translate to your mouth being more receptive to different textures. Yeah, it is. And it really goes back to what's happening in the brain because it's the same, you know, it's all the the tactile system. It's all the touch system. When our kids are so sensitive to textures, it's the same system that we see with their hands. So it's a really good idea to just be experimenting with different types of textures. So they're getting play in lots of different types of materials so that their brain is learning how to process all of those different types of textures. Yeah, that's great. That's a great tip. Just as our wrap up, you know, kind of winding down the interview here, if you had to give parents sort of your top tip or awareness builder, should they have a child with sensory sensitivities, what would that be? You know, I would say, particularly for sensory sensitivities, which is what we are seeing when we're talking about most kids that have an overlap with eating and sensory. So for sensitivities, I think it's most important that you are striking the balance, and this is challenging, but it's it's very possible as long as you're doing it on a regular basis to be pushing them just a little bit out of their comfort zone. Because we either, when a child is really sensitive to any type of sensory input, whether it's loud noises or strong smells or you know the grass under their feet, our tendency is either to force them to do it because we think it'll just help them get over it, or to just help them completely avoid it. I would rather, you know, the the lesser of those two is to just avoid it altogether, but to really help improve their sensory processing, it's to help give them the steps to just slowly start tolerating it. So that maybe they practice just touching the grass with their hands at first, or when you get into the sensory bin, if they can't put their hand in, maybe you give them a large wooden spoon that makes it possible. But maybe the next time they have a smaller spoon that gets their hands a little bit closer to the material. So the best tip I can say if you have a child with sensitivities is always to be trying to strike that balance between just pushing them enough out of their comfort zone so that they're they're growing and improving that sensory processing, but that you're never forcing them or giving too big of an ask for their sensory system. So last question for you. It's a new question I'm asking people. And I didn't prep you with this one. So, That's okay, I'm ready. <laughs> Are you ready? Yeah. 
What does it mean to you to be nourished? Oh, that's a good question. What does it mean to be nourished? For me, it means to be able to be well so that I, or if we're talking about a child, so that they are able to function at their full potential. Because when we are nourished, we are able to do everything, you know, with the skills and the gifts that we've been given to the best of our ability. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed that. I thought it was pretty good stuff. I personally find that sensory sensitivities are increasingly prevalent in children with picky eating. I chat about that in my articles about ARFID and extreme picky eating. I've talked about it on this show, which I will include those links in the show notes so you can go back and listen if you want to. But I hope you gained some fundamental things to think about when it comes to how your child is responding to food. So there are ways you can help your child. As I mentioned earlier, Alicia's course called Sensory Solutions is one way you can learn more about sensory challenges and what you can do at home to help your child. I have a book called Try New Food, How to Help Picky Eaters Taste, Eat, and Like New Foods. It's a workbook for parents. And as you know, I've written about picky eating, I've written about ARFID, and I have a few podcast episodes about those topics. All of those things I will include in the show notes, so you just head over to jillcastle.com forward slash 088, and you'll be able to find all the links so you can get to the articles, get to the podcasts if you want to you know, fine-tune your knowledge and your skills in that area. For more free nutrition and feeding education and advice, go ahead and subscribe to The Nourished Child. Even better, rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts or on one of your favorite Android apps. Up next on The Nourished Child, I have Lisa Leak, cookbook author and blogger. She's coming on the show to talk about 100 Days of Real Food on a Budget, her new cookbook. It's going to be a great episode, and I hope you will tune in. So thanks for joining me today. I know your time is tight, and I so appreciate being on your list of things to do. I know you're helping yourself and your child just by tuning in. Don't forget to give the child in your life a loving squeeze today. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Nourish Child Podcast, where the number one goal is to help you grow a nourished child inside and out.